In this learning module, we will focus on how to ask and answer research questions. For example, you might ask, what would happen if I implemented Reader's Theater in my classroom? Or, what would happen if students with special needs at my school were included in general education settings in preschool? Or, what would happen if teachers at my school implemented positive behavior intervention and supports? Or, what would happen if I used play interventions with emotionally disturbed students during a school counseling session? All of these questions have to do with trying something out to see what the results are. This is the heart of action research. As with all types of research, action research begins with the selection of a research topic, which provides focus and structure. Two of the most important things to keep in mind when selecting a topic are that it should be relevant, meaning that it has some current importance to the field, and that it is of interest to you. Research can often take longer than planned, so it is essential that you pick a topic that will keep you interested even when the process slows down or becomes challenging. So where do you get an idea for your research? Personal experiences are a great place to start, especially for action research, given that the focus of action research is on improving one's personal practice and or educational environment. Ask yourself, what problems am I currently facing at work? Would one of these problems be a good focus for trying out some new solutions? Various educational theories are another good source, as many theories are multifaceted and can be investigated with new populations or under new circumstances. An underutilized source of research topics is existing research studies. Many researchers are hesitant to replicate existing studies because of a belief that this is less important or useful. However, replication is essential for having confidence in research results. It is also a great way to determine whether existing study findings generalize not only to other samples within the same population, but to samples from other populations. Many educational topics are broad. Standardized testing, teacher attitudes, inclusion of students with special needs, classroom management. Such broad topics need to be narrowed to something that is more manageable and focused. When this occurs, however, depends on the type of research. A specific research topic and question or questions needs to be formulated at the beginning of the research process for quantitative studies. Qualitative studies are more flexible, although at least a preliminary focus of the research should be established prior to analyzing data. The challenging part of narrowing a topic is finding the right degree of narrowness. For example, a topic like standardized testing is way too broad to research. However, specific aspects of testing, like a comparison of the performance of first, second, and third generation students, is manageable and relevant. In contrast, a topic that is too narrow, the performance of blue-eyed, brown-haired fourth grade female students, is just silly. There would be no theoretical or practical reason to analyze data at this level of specificity. Remember, as you narrow your research topic, you will find fewer articles that are closely linked to your topic. You will need enough prior research that is sufficiently similar to your topic, though not necessarily identical, to build a case for your own study, so don't narrow too much. The research topic should be stated clearly. In quantitative research, this statement should describe the variables of interest, that is, what you are foc focusing on, any relationships among the variables, and a few aspects of the sample. For example, the topic to be investigated is inner city and suburban teacher satisfaction. The purpose of the study is to investigate differences in phonemic ability between kindergartners who attended preschool and those who did not. This study explores whether after school tutoring increases high school students' math scores. In contrast to quantitative studies, where the research topic is narrow and established at the beginning, Qualitative studies often start with broader topics that are only narrowed once the researcher begins data collection. For example, the purpose of this study is to describe the experiences of elementary students who have previously been retained. This study explores the feelings of new principals during their first year as administrators. This study examines the use of assistive technology for improving communication in a young child with autistic spectrum disorder. A research question is simply a reformulation of the research topic in question form. For example, do kindergartners who attend preschool and those who did not attend preschool differ in phonemic ability? 
does the use of assistive technology help improve the communication ability of a child with autism? This can be very helpful for formulating hypotheses, as a hypothesis is a direct answer, based on an educated guess, to the research question. In quantitative research, researchers make predictions about how the results will turn out. These predictions are called hypotheses. Hypotheses are formulated before data collection and are generally based on theory or knowledge gained through a careful review of the literature, that is, previous studies on the topic. Once the data are collected and analyzed, researchers can conclude that the hypothesis was either supported or not supported, but not proven or disproven. Gay, Mills, and Erasian, authors of the text Educational Research, Competencies for Analysis and Application, provide guidelines for good hypotheses. They suggest that hypotheses should be logical and reasonable and either consistent with an existing theory or consistent with previous research. Hypotheses should provide an explanation for the predicted outcome. They should operationally define variables, which means that they should define variables in terms of how these will be measured. And hypotheses should be testable within a reasonable time frame. In other words, if it would take 25 years to determine whether a hypothesis is supported or not, the hypothesis is weak. Various types of hypotheses are acceptable. Non-directional hypotheses state that a relationship exists among variables or a difference exists among groups. For example, there is a difference between male and female second graders in off-task behaviors. Directional hypotheses state the expected direction of the relationship among variables or difference among groups. Male second graders exhibit more off-task behaviors than female second grade, second grade students. Note that a non-directional hypothesis is less precise than a directional hypothesis and is generally only used when there is no good support for hypothesizing a specific difference or a relationship. The null hypothesis states that there is no significant relationship between variables or difference among groups. An example of the null hypothesis would be, there is no difference between male and female high school students in mathematical ability. Note that the research hypothesis generally should not be the null hypothesis. One reason for this is that most statistical analyses use the null hypothesis as the basis for testing an alternative hypothesis. To state the null hypothesis as the research hypothesis makes statistically testing this hypothesis difficult. Furthermore, when results are consistent with the null hypothesis, it is unclear whether this is because there really is no relationship between variables or difference among groups, or because the study was not conducted well, which can also result in null findings. Variables are things that can change or things that vary among people. In a research study, they stand for constructs or factors of interest. For example, testing method, computer or paper, gender, test score, or IQ. Anything that can have more than one value or type is a variable. For example, there are many types of ethnicity, so ethnicity could be a variable. However, one type is not a variable in itself. Asian American, for example, is not the variable per se. It is a person's status on the variable ethnicity. As we dive further into the details of hypotheses, we must cover a few more terms. A predictor variable is something that predicts something else, that is, the thing that comes first in a sequence. An outcome variable is something that happens after something else. An independent variable is the cause of something else, and a dependent variable is the effect of something else. It is very important to note that the first two terms are used for non-causal relationships. Two things are related, but one doesn't necessarily cause the other. The second two terms are used for causal relationships. The difference in the independent variable causes differences in the dependent variable. Now let's practice stating some hypotheses using this model. P stands for the participants, X stands for the predictor or independent variable, and Y stands for the outcome or dependent variable. Try to identify the P, X, and Y. 
The purpose of this study is to examine benefits in ninth grade students' achievement based upon attendance at a Saturday tutoring program. The participants are ninth grade students. The predictor variable is Saturday program attendance or non-attendance. The outcome variable is achievement. Now you try. Identify the P, X, and Y. The purpose of this study is to examine differences in social skills between those middle school children who are involved in extracurricular activities and those who are not involved in extracurricular activities. In this example, the participants are middle school children. The predictor variable is extracurricular activities. The outcome variable is social skills. How did you do? Once data are collected, the results are compared to the predicted results, that is, the hypothesis. Remember, hypotheses are not proven. They are supported or not supported. Valuable contributions to, to the literature can still be made if a hypothesis is not supported. An excellent example of this comes from medical research. Several studies failed to find support for the superior effectiveness of a new medication to a placebo, or sugar pill. Although this may seem disappointing, researchers have been interested to find that many patients improve while taking the placebo, even in the absence of any real medication. The role of a patient's positive expectations would not have been discovered if this failure to support the research hypothesis had not happened. Most of what we have just discussed applies most to quantitative studies. In qualitative studies, the researcher usually does not state formal hypotheses before conducting the study. Qualitative researchers sometimes develop flexible guiding hypotheses, but it is more typical for them to start with research questions and not to make guesses about how the results will turn out.